Hello and welcome to Family Time once again. As you know, Family Time is a program that looks at families, the issues we have, and how to ensure that we build a godly family the way the Lord wants us to be. Um, today we are looking at ways to leave a godly legacy. We're not looking at just ordinary legacies. We're not looking at how much money you leave in the bank for your children. We're not looking at how many houses or whether the mortgage is paid or not. We are interested in a godly legacy. As usual, I have with me Pastor Kingsley PJ, Head Pastor Trinity Baptist Church, West Norwood, and Pastor Mrs. Cynthia PJ, Co-Pastor Trinity Baptist Church, West Norwood. You're both very welcome. Pastor, godly legacy, what do we mean exactly? Uh, unfortunately for many, when you talk about legacy, it is the fat bank account. It is the number of houses that you leave, and uh, for many also, it's, it's an inheritance issue. As much as all those are important, uh, the most important legacy um, any man can leave are the values that are transmitted to uh, the children, who now on their own will have to take their positions. And uh, there are values that are, um, that are godly, and which are transmitted through godly men. And as to how society will become in the next century depends on the legacy that we are living today. And you see, legacy is not necessarily what you leave, but the life you live. Because what I leave today will determine the legacy I leave tomorrow. So godly legacy are the values we pass on to the next generation. Uh, Pastor C, how do these values affect the next generation? I believe that um, we are who we are today um, um, because of what we, the way we were brought up and all the influences we had in, our, in you know, growing up. I, 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 I always tell my children that I see myself doing similar things that in, you know, to what my mother would do um, because I've caught things from my mother. And I think that legacy, as Pastor said, is something that we live, um, live out. Godly legacy is lived out and then becomes a godly legacy. And so um, if, we have, if we have passed on, if we have inherited a good legacy, we catch it and, and we then also pass it on to the next generation. So if, if our legacy was a healthy one, it's great for our marriage and it will be great for our children too. And what happens is that they also pick that same godly legacy that you are giving them and they pass it on to the next generation. It is so vital. Um, sometimes you, you don't even see yourself do it, but you just realize that, oh my goodness, I'm just almost following the footsteps of my mother. You of my, mother. You've become your mother in the ways that they, you know, you've picked up things that they've taught you and things that you've caught from their lifestyles. Okay. Pastor Kay, the very fact that we are talking about godly legacy, prefix the legacy with godly, means that there are other legacies. Yes. So what are the different types of legacies that people could leave for the next generation? Oh, many. Um, uh, unfortunately, some have left uh, people legacies of crime, uh, gangsters, um, and you will see that there are some families. This thing has perpetuated. It's been a um, it was passed on, and um, there are other good legacies like uh, um, where businesses, how to do uh, uh, things especially are left. If you look at many of uh, the manufacturing uh, companies, in the past they were family oriented, and those legacies were passed on. If you look at Ford, uh, it began with Ford, the Ford family. And now it, it has become a multinational uh, company. So, Pazzi, what would you say was the legacy of your parents? What did you inherit yourself? I, I inherited a peaceful home. Um, I, I remember very vividly uh, one of the things and one of the strengths of my parents is the fact that they do have disagreements. But by the morning, and we used to ask them, and we used to laugh, and I said, ah, yesterday, there was a little argument between the two of you when you went to bed. But the next morning, it's as if, you know, these people were not even, and I think that was an example. They probably didn't know what they were doing, but it taught me a lesson that, you know what, there could be disagreements, and it's okay 
to have disagreements in the home, um, but the children need to see you the next day as if nothing has happened at all. And, and that's something I, I, I have learned um, 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 from my parents, and it's a good legacy. Um, some of the other legacies I've learned is the fact that, um, you know, we are, we are a Christian family, and, um, you know, going to church and being, you know, being, you know, serious with your Christian life is another legacy that, that, that we've picked up, um, a legacy of, of him singing. Um, so now my husband is a, is a great, you know, he sings hymns a lot. And, you know, you, you, you could, I could hear sometimes my parents, they, they were both in the choir. So my dad sings the bass and my mom sings high tenor. And you'd be hearing a lot of hymns singing in the home. Uh, it's something that we've inherited and my husband does that as well. So it's, it's carrying on. <laughs> and um, although our children don't, I mean, this generation, they don't sing hymns a lot. But I know that something that they will carry is that, you know, every morning when you wake up in the house, you hear hymns, you know, now that, you know, pastor plays hymns every, every morning at home, you will hear hymns. And these are good legacies. I think that when you wake up in the morning and they're playing hymns in the home, the last thing you want to do is to start quarreling, you know. The, <laughs> the atmosphere is almost set. Um, by the time you're up, there is a kind of atmosphere that is set in the home. There is hymns singing and, you know, playing, so a serene atmosphere. Mm. That's okay. Uh, I want us to look at it from both angles. Uh, what were the good legacies um, you inherited from your parents and whether there were any bad ones as well that you said, mm -mm, I don't, when I grew up, I don't that, think I'll that, do this. That, 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 that's a very hard question because uh, <laughs> uh, my dad was a polygamist okay. and uh, um, well-educated man, but unfortunately, uh, got himself involved with all these uh, kinds of women. Uh, but one thing I learned from him was the fact that uh, he was a gentleman. Despite all his moral uh, weaknesses, he was such a gentleman. And I think that if there's one major thing I've picked from him, uh, I love not to fight, not to engage anybody in a brawl, not to shout back, forth and back. And, I don't do that. I never saw my dad do that. Uh, but morally, I don't think he left me any, um, any good example. And no wonder when I came to know Christ, I was de very determined by God's grace to reverse that tide and to ensure that all what my children will know and see um, is a man who uh, <clears throat> at the age of a hundred years, when it's time for God to call me home, uh, can not only say that I've known only one uh, wife throughout my life, but they can have that example that we had a dad, we had a granddad, who throughout his life knew only one woman. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Um, Pastor C, I think I'll ask you the same. You've spoken about all the good yeah. leg uh, legacies that you inherited from your parents. Yeah. Was there any particular ones that you said, I'm not taking this when I grow yeah. up? Yeah, mm. I think uh, my, my dad was noted for saying it as it is. And uh, it has its good um, sides to it. Um, but I think that sometimes it just creates for you <laughs> unnecessary enemies. Um, so one thing I, I knew that I would not do is to say it as it is all the time, but that I would find a, a way to say it. My dad will say it no matter who you are. He will say it just as it is. Um, and sometimes it's very hard for people to take it when you, when you say it like that and, and raw. Um, and, and what you find is you just create you know, enemies unnecessarily. Some, there's something I, I'd said that, you know what, I, I, I wouldn't go that way. Um, you have to find a way, a nice way of saying what you, the same thing, but not so blunt, you know. <laughs> and I think that that, that is something I, I just knew, you know, that is not a, a legacy I would, I would carry on.
-hmm. It's quite interesting talking to you both that I now understand why you do this. I now understand where Pastor C's uh, diplomacy comes from. Uh, she's extremely diplomatic. So I now know, okay, mm -hmm. it's in reaction to she had a dad. And I now totally understand Pastor's principles about morality and holiness and keeping yourself pure. So, you know, it's very interesting to see how even the negative influences uh, from your families have shaped you. Um, but Pasquet, I know you, you have a Chinese proverb that you're very, very, very fond of. This is about, you know, the trees we build and people inheriting the shade. So I want you to briefly talk us through that proverb. And then, you know, and maybe if you can give us a biblical example of someone who left a bad legacy and what the impact is on our lives now. Yes. Uh, the Chinese proverb um, says that one generation plants trees and another generation sits under the shades of those trees. Simply because when you plant trees, it takes time for the uh, tree to grow, to spread out its branches, to give shade to people. So in other words, um, our generation uh, are sitting under the shades of the trees that were planted by our forefathers. Uh, and the question we must ask ourselves are what are some of the trees they planted uh, for which we are sitting under its shades. And I think that they planted shades of the fear of God, uh, shades of high morality, shades of respect, shades of how to honor adults, uh, shades of being honest, uh, extremely important. And uh, if you study scripture, one person that stands out in that, it's so sad that many of these great men of God who were mightily used by God did not pay attention to their families. Someone never did. And uh, well, Eli was the first who made that big mistake and uh, his, his children were unfortunately uh, sleeping with women right in the temple. And Samuel's children unfortunately unfortunately did not fear God the way they should because Samuel was too busy doing God's work and did not keep an eye on them. David brought up children who were uh, indulging in power struggle, uh, incest, killing one another simply because David did not pay heed by one man who did that so well is Joshua. And Joshua was bold at the end of his life to say that, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And God also said about Abraham, that I know Abraham, that he will order his children aright. And my prayer, that you see, that is a legacy that God himself can talk about you and say that this is a man I can trust because I know that he will order his family well. And so Abraham stands out for me, and also that, so also does um, Joshua. Uh, Juliet, the question that every family, as we talk about legacy, must be asking themselves is, uh, how will my, um, how, how, you want to ask that question or you want me to go on? Uh, which question, how will every? Okay, you want me to go on? The question is, uh, when we talk about legacy and how to live a legacy, you must ask yourself, how will my children talk about me if I'm not there? If my children gather with their friends and they are talking about that, what are the things they will say about me? If my wife goes out to her friends and is talking about me to her friends, what legacy? Sorry, what, what will my wife say about me? A man who's a tyrant at home and a saint at church, a wife bitter at home, and a counselor at church, a, a, a giver at church, and a miser at home, a wicked man at home, and a good man outside. Our legacies are formed by the way that we treat our wives and our children at home. And the question every man, every woman must ask themselves, uh, how will my spouse talk about me? If I'm not there and my wife is telling my story, what will she say about Pastor Kingsley? Who am I? And no two people know as better 
than our wives and our children. Mm -hmm. As for God, even before we think he does. Mm. You see, a lot of women would think that this doesn't apply to them. Because once we talk about legacy, most women think, ah, is the man's domain. You have to set an example for the children. You have to set an example for society. Mm -hmm. So as Pastor has said, for women, what do you think the yardstick is? What are the sort of issues or questions that we should also be thinking about yeah. when it comes to leaving a godly legacy? Yeah. Uh, one thing that I, I ask myself, it's a question that raises in my heart all the time. Yeah, and and um, is this, how will my children <laughs> turn out? you know how will they turn out as adults in the future it's uh, something that i think about a lot because um i believe that god gives the children to us for a season and god partners with us or we partner with god and then they leave home now um we have one that has left home and when she was about to leave home i there's this thing just really even dawned on my heart even more and i kept asking myself i hope I have done a good enough work for this one that is leaving home, such that when she goes, she'll be able to stand on her feet, she'll be a good testimony to her in-laws, to her husband. Um, and so it's something that every woman should ask, and every man should ask, how our children will turn out in the future. And um, the legacy that we live, and what, how they will become, has a very big uh, bearing on how we ourselves are living today as a family. So if my children always see me insulting my husband, I can be sure that they will probably go out there probably doing the same thing. Um, and they watch us very silently and they pick things without even, with even uh, yesterday we were talking about, a few days ago we were talking about how do you impart values? Is it through um, instruction, direct instruction. Some of it is through direct instruction. Some of it as well is not through direct instruction. It is caught. And so how we live our lives today will be, you know, so if you want to see how your daughter or your son will become in 25, 30 years time, I think you can look at yourself today. And the picture you see of yourself is probably going to be the mirror image of what? Your own children will become years down the line. And so I think Yes, it's not only a question for, for the, the head of the home, it's a question for both the husband and wife. And to, to, to add to that, um, if we go, we go back to biblical times, um, uh, what Pastor C has just said is so important because <laughs> what kind of children are we bringing up and how are they going to be in the next generation? Today, even though Abraham did very well to order his children right, the single um, major mistake he made in his life, uh, that was um, sleeping with his uh, handmaid and uh, her maid servant and having uh, Ishmael with him has now become the bone of contention almost in the world. And Abraham left a very excellent legacy. Uh, we, the Christians, have uh, the blessing we receive from Christ by faith is the blessings of Abraham. And because of our connection now with Christ being grafted in, it is the blessings of Abraham that now comes upon us. So today, the war between, unfortunately, Israel and the Arabic neighbors is simply because of what happened between Isaac and Ishmael. And we have to be, and you will see that most polygamous mar marriages uh, have left the same legacy. I know that in Ghana, there is a big uh, uh, conflict where two brothers uh, from the same father have been fighting up to today. And not only in Ghana, in many, 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 many African countries. So it becomes extremely important that the way we conduct ourselves and we must understand that not only does anything we do has consequences, but we must be mindful of the legacy we will leave.
Thank, thank you very much, Pastor. Um, Pastor C, so from what you're both telling us, you know, the, the arena within which you build your legacy is the, is the family. Is, is, am I right? That's uh, right. Okay. It's the family. Um, th that's the, the arena in which uh, 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 right. the future or the legacy is, is, is created and it's built. Um, home is where the children form their identity, understand who they are. Um, even when you talk about a tangible, uh, the tangible legacies, it's all in the home. It's the particular home that you come from and what legacies, tangible legacies they leave you. In the same way, it's still the home that transmits the intangible legacies that we are talking about, the godly legacies that we are talking about. So the bedrock of society is the home. And so whatever legacies that we need to, to build on is first built in the home. Pastor, why, you know, I, I think maybe I know the answers, but I'm not very sure, so I'll ask you anyway. Why do you think the concept of home and family is so strong in the Bible? Why does it permit couldn't God have used something else? No, no, Juliet. Because, simply because God in his own wisdom began society with, with, with family. Uh, and uh, the world will end at that banqueting table where the family of God will be gathered with Christ. Uh, family is so important and it permeates um, legacy because that is where it starts. Uh, you cannot leave uh, a legacy. Your legacy can never be so impacting if in your own home there is nothing to show. Uh, of course, people have made inventions that have benefited the world, medical inventions that has become uh, um, worthy for mankind uh, medically. But when we talk about godly uh, a godly legacy it is that which begins in your home because no society will arise above the strength of its own family strength if the families are stronger the society will be stronger the nation will be stronger and you will see that every attack of the enemy is first against the family redefining what family is all about, uh, redefining the age at which children uh, uh, can have abortion, redefining uh, the, the, the age when a child can be termed as an adult. So you see that straight away the attack of the enemy is always against the family because it is central to the heart of God. Central. I think that um, even in, in, in our society, you, we find, and especially in the, in the, in the Western world, um, in the political arena, um, they take seriously what is happening in your family. So if any scandal comes up about any minister or any, any leader of any sort, um, the, the immediately, you know, the press are on it. Because the idea is that if you can't have a grip of what your family life, you can't lead other people. So. Even in the secular political arena, the family is so important and they will bash you if anything should leak about your family life and if it's negative. That, that should teach us something. Yeah. So Pastor, for a man who is not in control of his family, how does that affect his uh, building his legacy? Oh, it affects everything because uh, every man must understand that your legacy does not begin at your working place or in your ministry or the money you leave, but uh, it occurs, uh, uh, what occurs in your family and ministry will only be as deep as your relationship with Christ is. So for any man who um, does not pay that attention and understand that family, your, your legacy begins at home, he will be at a loss with himself. So Pastor C, uh Family is important, but I hear you always, you know, you never say family, you say home. You know, how different is that from the concept of the family, or is it the same thing? I, when I say home, um, sometimes people look at home and think it is the four corners or the concrete and the, um, I, I think that is house. 
um, home is is more than that. It is the intangible. It, it's what makes the home the home. It, it, it is the man, it's the woman, it's the, if there are kids, it's, it's the kids, or it's the, if it's a single mother as well, it's the mother and the children, and that makes it home. So um, when I talk about home, it is, it is family. It, it is um, not the, I'm not talking about the, the tangibles of the things you can touch, it is the atmosphere that we set. It is whether the, there is warm or it's cold in the home. So it is people that make up the home, um, not, not the things that we have bought. It's not the articles that are beautifully laid out in the house, but it's what we make of it, uh, of the relationships that go on in that home. And that's okay. So you as a mother and a, and a wife, what would you you know, okay, the family's in the home. Um, that's uh, the, um, I'm understanding from what you're saying. So as a mother and a wife, what would you be contributing or what should you be contributing to the home to ensure that the family, it's a good place and then, you know, the legacies are being built the way they should be built? I think that um, I believe that the woman has a place in setting the tone in the home, um, has a place in setting the temperature in the home. My duty, as I, I believe as a mother, is that the, the kids would, will need to come home and my husband needs to come home to find that um, uh, it's a peaceful home, that I'm not creating trouble and problems and you know, wanting to quarrel all the time, but when they come home, they find it as a peaceful place um, to be, um, a place where you know, I'm a listening ear. Um, I believe that my role as a, as a mother is to go before the Lord in prayer every day, bringing my family before, before God um, and bringing all their circumstances before God. I believe that my role is that I am, the, I am an intercessor for my children. And so my children can be comfortable to come to me and say, Mom, now pray about this or now pray in this direction. Um, so there's a step-by-step -step thing. We were praying about this particular thing and then now something has changed. So we change direction in what we are praying about. I believe I need to set a tone. Um, I believe that my role is that um, I know that every man comes home and they don't want to come home to a nagging <laughs> wife. So I, my role, and I understand that um, even if I'm unhappy about something, I find a wise way of dealing with it. Um, and, and I don't meet him with a you know, snap as soon as they come through the door. I believe that my role is such that I have to create um, an atmosphere where the, the husband would love to, always love to come home to, and my children would love to come home to a, a peaceful setting is what is my goal in creating a, of her home. So Pastor, Pastor C has lovingly and you know in a very nice way uh, demonstrated what a wife should be contributing to the home uh, to enable it to be an atmosphere where legacies can be built. What should the man be contributing? I think the man as a head uh, should be stabilizing the home, ensure that uh, as I said the other time the, the, the home is a sanctuary, it's a nest of safety. Uh, it's a place where provision is made on time. It is a place where the right values are transmitted. And most importantly, that it's a loving home. Loving home. Okay. Thank you very much, Pastor Kinsley, and thank you, Pastor Cynthia. On that note, unfortunately, we come to the end of our time together for this program. We've been looking at how to build a godly legacy. Today we looked at what legacies are, how to build a godly one. We've looked at the family, the home, which acts as a crucible within which the godly legacy can be created. Pastor has said some very nice things before we finished. He says the home is a nest. When we come back next time, uh, we'll take Pastor on, on these things that he said uh, about the home being a nest, uh, the man's role in stabilizing what goes on in the home, and he'll take us through it and explain how each and every one of those principles are meant to come to play in our homes. Thank you for being with us and join us next time.